If you were a kid growing up in the 80s and 90s in the UK, you would have been brought up on a staple diet of ready brick, watery custard on your spotted dick, look it up, and once you got home from school, Blue Peter. Blue Peter was basically a current affairs program for kids, not exactly dumbing things down, but presenting them in a way that could be understood by 10 year olds. For me, it was watching John Noakes climbing Nelson's column with our safety harness, a zookeeper bringing a baby elephant into the studio that crapped on the floor and nearly crippled one of the presenters, to be as happy as we're obviously going to be when we're on holiday. Oh, get off me foot! Not <laughs> oh, thanks very much. <laughs> well, our animals are going to be happy, in fact, because they're going away on holiday too. They're going to spend it out in the country, but Lulu won't be there. <laughs> and the famous multi-part series on how to build your own Tracy Island. But from that early age, I was always more interested when they talked about upcoming movies, and they always seemed to get the big scoops. Sure, they got Mark Hamill and Carrie Fisher on to talk about Star Wars, but the real scoop for me was this opening sequence where they talked about Biggles' Adventures in Time. I'm a big fan of behind the scenes stuff, and this excerpt, alongside another review that happened on Saturday Superstore a few days later, really caught my interest. I had a very passing knowledge of who the character Biggles was, and the trailer shown on TV made it look bloody amazing. By the way, if you think this guy looks familiar... I love initiations. I am now of age, Greenfather. I ask for the test of manhood. Choose your passage into this world or the next. May Arbor guide you. Of course, this was back when I was a non-earning child. Not until I started that market job a couple of years later anyway. So I would have to wait until the oldie VHS was released. When that time came, it was everything I'd hoped for and more. Of course, at that time, I was still looking at the entertainment industry with rose-tinted spectacles. Every movie I saw was amazing, from Ishtar to Haunted Honeymoon, every movie could do no wrong. Then of course, I grew up. Fast forward many years, and while digging through the DVD bargain bin of what used to be HMV, I came across a copy on DVD. At the bargain price of £5.99, I'd have been a fool not to have snapped it up. Took it home, popped the disc in, and slowly watched certain parts of my childhood come crashing down around my ears. I mean, it's not a terrible movie. There were just some dumbfoundedly bizarre decisions on display throughout the film. Not the casting, though. Jim Ferguson is played by David Hyde Pierce, sorry, Alex Hyde White, who would later go on to appear as that guy in Pretty Woman, but more notoriously as Reed Richards in Roger Corman's deliberately ill-fated Fantastic Four movie. A movie made to hold on to the name with no intention of being released, if you want to know more about that one, seek out Red Letter Media's Best of the Worst episode that compares Fantastic Four to other poorly made superhero movies of the time. But I digress. Neil Dixon is James Bigglesworth. My friends call me Biggles. Chisel jawed hero of the movie and dashed fine soldier to boot. If you can fly a sop with camel, you can fly anything. He's one of those actors who has never stopped working, and you've probably seen or heard him in something else but would be hard pressed to pick him out of a crowd. It's also a movie that has the unique distinction of being the only film that has both Grand Moff Tarkin and Porkins in the same scene at the same time. William Hootkins has a pretty big side role in the film. We have a slight problem with our trailers. It's, it's ridiculous, we can't let the buyers see this. Jim, we need this cover, huh? It's modern, it's stylish, it's sexy. It's Maybe Chuck, but it just isn't us. And the wonderful Peter Cushing plays his final movie role with the professionalism and dignity he was famous for. If I had to stick someone with this, as you so eloquently put it, I would not have picked you. Fiona Hutchinson is Debbie, Jim's love interest, and despite initial impressions, gets mucked in with the rest of them and even takes time to pull a dead German's face apart. There's a few more actors to look into if you're bored on IMDb on a wet weekend, and a few of the names that might pop up might surprise you, but back to the movie. For reasons known only to the scriptwriters, an American, Jim Ferguson, is thrown back in time to World War I just in time to see a biplane crash, which was apparently accidental, and rescue the pilot, because they're time twins or some... I think Biggles is your time twin. Listen, you got anything stronger than tea? This happens again a few more times, often with hilariously comical results. And Ferguson becomes more involved with helping Biggles and his chums uncover and thwart the Hun's dastardly plot to unleash their new terrible sound weapon onto the masses. 
I know it looks like a massive umbrella with bits of tin foil attached, but apparently it's based on something the Nazis were actually working on during World War II. But big props to the construction crew for making this thing life size, not so much to the visual effects crew. Sorry about that. Oh, and there's a romantic subplot featuring Marie from A Lower Low that somehow acts as a sort of slow paced finale after the finale. In analysis, I'd say there were two downsides and one big USP that level the movie out and make it somewhat watchable. The first is the editing and shot selection. I'm no fan of Michael Bay esque pointless shaky cam and hanging out of car window shots, but a little more involvement from the actors wouldn't have gone amiss. In this scene, Jim's a passenger in a biplane for the first time in his life, in what's supposed to be a semi-intense dogfight, and he looks like he's being driven to the dentist. Then there's the always dreadful walking around taking everything in to build tension when there really isn't any scenes. A little clipping here and there would have tidied the scenes up nicely, plus a little attention to detail here and there would have been nice. The movie is shot entirely in the UK, with some London back streets supposedly standing here for New York with a lot of the scenes taking place around and inside London's iconic Tower Bridge, with Ferguson rather handily staying in a nearby hotel, a literal stone's throw away and has hardly changed in the last 35 years or so, on the outside at least. Unfortunately, this leads to a rather glaring continuity error. Stand still or we'll shoot! Where are you trying to get to? Tower Bridge. Luckily, there aren't that many errors in the film, apart from Ferguson magically finding a Sten gun somewhere, even though they weren't made until the late 30s, plus Peter Cushing's pet raven relieving himself rather noisily on the carpet in Tower Bridge. It was taken when our unit received its first commendation. And while we're at Tower Bridge, how did Peter Cushing get up those stairs with his dicky leg? And why is Ferguson entering through this door when all the important stuff, like the supposed living quarters and the machine room, were under the main towers? For continuity's sake, I'm going to jump to the feature of the film that almost makes it worth watching, and that's the aerial combat scenes. They are nothing short of spectacular, and some of the stunt work on display has yet to be beaten. The biplanes used in the movie were actually from the 1930s, as using the types of plane that were actually around during World War I were prohibitively expensive to maintain, plus there's no guarantee they would have survived the aerobatics on display. The modern aeronautical hero is this Bell Jet Ranger, flown by legendary Hollywood stunt pilot Mark Wolf. It is also worth noting that some of the more extreme stunt work was obviously performed by stunt workers, but not here. That's actually Alex Hyde White strapped to the outside of a helicopter while it plats around by a tower bridge. Sitting in the same helicopter as it flies perilously close to the ground near the end of the movie, and here we see Alex narrowly missing being shot in the head by a crew member. Wait, what? Sign of the times, I suppose. When you want a small budget that was probably all spent on the aerial department and an expensive Bell helicopter that was all exploded at the end, you have to make do. Well, no, it wasn't exploded, obviously. That didn't happen for another three years after it was destroyed in a crash after it was accidentally flown into some power cables in Gloucestershire. Which now brings me to the biggest downside of the film, and an aspect which may leave many heading for the mute button, and that's a god-awful soundtrack. The opening credits proudly proclaimed that the music was provided by Stanislas, who upon further investigation, by which I mean actually sitting through the credits, is actually Stanislas Sirovich, who had collaborated with John Anderson, former lead singer and frontman of Yes. Maybe it was the clash of their original music styles, but the resulting soundtrack is almost distressingly out of place for what's supposed to be a sort of period piece. Holding down the orchestra hit button on your Casio keyboard doesn't really sit well in the trenches. Aside from some other background tracks from other, let's say, better established artists, such as Motley Crue, Deep Purple and even Queen, the two songs from Stanislas and Anderson as presented front and centre, by which I mean they use several times, almost ad nauseum. Do You Want to Be a Hero is the main theme, played over the opening credits, and to be honest, it's probably why I was such a fan of the film back in the 80s. It's certainly of its time, and I can still see what the appeal at the time would have been. But alas, in later years, it's clear that a lack of a decent overall soundtrack compelled those wacky editors to reuse the same song over and over and over. Although I will admit, 
If it had been used just the once, this was the best place for it, as it fits the scene perfectly. There is another song used a few times in the film by the same artist, but it's just so rubbish I'm, I'm not that keen on putting it on here. It's called Chocks Away and you can find it on YouTube. I could provide a link below, but I don't want to. There was another song released in conjunction with the film, written by John Deacon from Queen, and featured Peter Cushing in his last ever on-screen appearance. The song failed to chart, a sad farewell indeed. A couple of final thoughts. Firstly, this film somehow managed to bag a royal charity premiere which meant Princess Diana probably watched it at some point. But personally, I've never seen a film at the cinema that was originally shot in 4-3 aspect ratio, which is a format that was used in the original VHS and DVD releases. For some reason, I found myself double dipping and splashed out for the Blu-ray release a couple of years ago. But for some other reason, despite being the superior media format, the abundance of special features on the DVD are nowhere to be seen. It's also slightly odd that while the video and audio have been cleaned up considerably for the higher resolution release, they seem to have slightly sped up the frame rate and zoomed in on what would have been the original 4.3 aspect ratio, but have managed to find a little extra at the edges. So is it worth watching? I'd say yeah, because in places there's a lot of time and effort that have been put into the film. The cast are trying their best and the stunt work is amazing. And it's the last movie that Peter Cushing appeared in. Just remember to hit the mute button when it counts.